Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today we are going to explore in a lecture given by Neville Goddard on October 13th, 1967, called The Wearer of the Mask. And using the mask as an analogy, he begins to tell us the story of where we came from with a description at some points of who the Elohim is and some excellent stories and letters that he gets and some stories that he gives. And as always, I really enjoyed it. Can't wait for you to hear it. The Wear of the Mask by Neville Goddard. The eternal body of man is all imagination. And that is called in scripture, Jesus Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 24. So if I find myself in this place where I am miserable and I feel myself helpless, it is not a condemnation of some deity outside of myself. I either knowingly or unknowingly fell into that state for all things exist in God. Every conceivable situation that you could ever think of now exists as fact in God. But it is not made visible in our world until someone occupies it. We are the operant power of God. There isn't a thing in this world that doesn't need a man as an agent to express it. We speak of hate. We speak of love. We speak of all these things. Well, some man expresses it. And then we write about the man. He was simply in a state. He either entered it knowingly, unknowingly, but if he remains in it, then he externalizes that state. So everyone in this world is free to choose. And so I am imagining myself into my present state. If I don't like it, I must imagine myself out of it into the state that I like. For everyone in the beginning, believe it or not, we were all together. As we're told in scripture, he chose us in himself before the foundation of the world. All form God. Now, here, we have a preconceived plan, and then we who conceived it collectively form one, one wonderful, glorious being. And then together, we spoke as one. And we said, it is time for the play to begin. And you and I individually answered, I am ready. And then we started. We conceived the play. Every conceivable horrible thing in the world. And every conceivable lovely thing in the world. Every problem. Every solution. You can't conceive of something that was not in that original conception. That preconceived plan. And then it is time to start. You and I, having conceived it ourselves, we said, I'm ready. When we said, I am, that's God. It's ready to take upon itself everything that it had conceived, and then it starts off into this fabulous world of ours. So now, no matter what you are doing, what you are experiencing, you are not doing it. You're not condemned by some being outside of yourself you either wittingly or unwittingly fell into it good bad or indifferent now how do we move here we are told in the very beginning of genesis it's the second verse and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters we are told now that when he first speaks to joshua which is the hebrew name for Jesus in the first chapter of Joshua that wherever the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given you Joshua 1 3 now you be the chooser of where you will allow the sole of your foot to tread wherever it treads I've given it to you because the whole is yours and he speaks now to Jesus well forget Jesus as some historical creature 2,000 years ago. I'm speaking to Jesus when I speak to you. Christ 
in you is the hope of glory. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? 2 Corinthians 13.5 I'm speaking to your own wonderful human imagination. So when I say that God became man, that man may become God, I mean the same as if I said imagination becomes man, that man may become all imagination. It's the same thing. But man hasn't the same association. He doesn't use the word imagination as he uses the word God. When he uses the word God, it's something remote, something out of his mind altogether, some being that created it all apart from him. If I use imagination, you will know more of what I'm talking about. So imagination became man, that man may become all imagination. And everything in this world, the whole vast world, is all imagination. And so when our realists think that they are nearer to the truth, they don't realize they are depicting nothing more than their own imagination. So they laugh at you and me when we call ourselves the mystically inclined. May I tell you, let them be just as they are. Don't encourage them, but leave them just as they are. And you go blindly on simply imagining that you are the being that you want to be and you will become it. You have imagined yourself into what you are and you must imagine yourself into what you want to be. No outside deity did it for you. You were not under compulsion to do it. You fell into misery or you fell into this because you did not know you are God. That you are the being who conceived it in the beginning and then fell deliberately. No one took it from you. You fell deliberately into these states and started the journey. So I say you can prove it right now. You can start tonight. Not by being a holy person. I'm not speaking of being any holy person as the world calls it. For the story of Jesus is so unlike its original. When you read what the so-called wise men speak about, all the churches, all these so-called isms, it's so far removed from the original story. It is just as far removed as Dante's Inferno is from the Sermon on the Mount. Yet that is based upon Scripture. That strange, peculiar concept into which he fell. So he had the capacity to write. And what beautiful, beautiful words he could string together. But what state into which he fell. Yet he is writing supposedly Scripture. And that's what the churches follow. So, it is so completely different from the real true story of Jesus. Jesus is every being in this world. There is only Jesus. The word means Jehovah saves. There's only one Savior. The one who fell is the one who saves himself. No one else saves you. You are saved by your own being. You become aware. You begin to remember. And remembering, you turn around and simply come out of the very play into which you have sent yourself. All in the end are united and we form into the single being that fell. One being containing all fell. And in the end, all are gathered. Not one will be lost and all are regathered into the one being that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the story. Now, I received this week some beautiful letters, perfectly wonderful letters. Here is one. The lady said, 
I heard you 10 years ago, but then I didn't write because, first of all, you were not asking for letters, and secondly, I was not in the habit of writing. But I did make a record of what happened soon after I heard you. I found myself in what the world would call dream, but it was more than dream. I call it vision. I was at the top of the highest mountain. She didn't use the word world. She said the universe. And some force held me looking toward the horizon. This fantastic vastness without a shore. I knew below me there were clouds, strange clouds, but I couldn't look down from this enormous height. I was held to look at the distance. Then to my right, a little flicker, a spark appeared. Then to my left, the vastness away. Another little spark there. Then another spark there. And suddenly I felt that this cloud made an imperceptible forward motion, a slight. I knew it was moving forward. Then these lights appeared. And then suddenly through the clouds came a burst of light. White light that filled infinity. As it filled it, the clouds began to move. Not only forward, but in all directions. They took on motion in every direction. And standing there, I knew how I knew. I couldn't tell you, but I pointed and I said, That's Paul. Then the light diffused, filling all. And then another burst of light came, this time in multiple color. I can't explain it. But the light was living. The color was alive. The whole thing was alive. Living color. But every color conceivable was all bursting through. I knew as I did prior to this who it was, and I said, that is Neville. Then came a shower of golden needles penetrating my brain. It was almost unbearable as it penetrated my brain. And then I woke from it all and wrote it down. Over the years, I would ponder on this. I would take it out from my drawer and think about it, pondering but I'd get no response to the meaning of it. My friends, Natalie and Lucy, would focus it with me, but we couldn't bring any light to hear upon the meaning of it until last Monday when you spoke and then I saw of a world beyond dream where a being of light shoots his fiery arrows into the brain of those that he has called. It's the same story over and over and over. There's only one Jesus Christ. There's only one Lord, only one God, and father of us all and we are the god and father of it all we conceived it and we are playing it and each in his own wonderful good time will play it play the part in the end it's all god so hate no one because all agreed in the beginning and we're under masks while we play this part because we are completely masked we don't recognize ourselves who agreed in the beginning when this whole play was conceived and predicted, not in a fatalistic sense, for I fell into a state of that state, not by being some outside of myself, that was arranged in the beginning, that I couldn't fall into any state, and get out of any state, and keep going, but I had to keep going. I must complete the play. I must finish the play, but when I get to the end of the road, I turn around and come back. I go from here to the end, and then I turn around and return, and then I return to whom? Return to the very beginning that I was in the beginning. Now, a gentleman writes me that he had this unusual dream, which puzzled him. He said, you asked for the unusual. Well, I had this experience. Here I saw this man about 26 years old, golden curls on his head, golden hair, all curly hair. But he seemed to be in this cylinder and seemed to be sunk into at least the floor or the earth because he only came up to the waist of two men who were next to him. They were working on what I thought would be his hair. I thought they were giving him a haircut. They seemed to be working on the top of his head towards the back of his skull. And then I realized as I looked at him, they were doing more than that. They were not only taking off the hair, they were taking down into the skull. I looked at the man and the man simply raised his hand and put it on his skull and felt that emptiness as he pushed his hand down into his own skull. Well, I was intrigued and it was unbelievable what I was seeing, so I went around to look at him. I got above him and here, the skull, this enormous vacant area, and I thought, well, 
they might have removed the brain, but they hadn't. The whole thing seemed to be plastic, made of clay or some plastic. So I got in front of the man. When I got in front of the man by then, as it happens in vision, it switched from an interior to an exterior, and it's dessert. His chin is resting on the sand himself, but I look at him. It's kind of a mask that you see in Africa or in Hawaii where the native wears. You can never see this wearer. You can only see the mask that the wearer is wearing. I couldn't see who wore it. I could only see a mask. It was just a mask. Well, that is the world. You don't know who you're looking at. You're looking at the most intimate being in the world. When you look at anyone in this world, one you knew in the beginning and one that you will know forever. We all put on masks and we're all playing the play, playing anything, playing the weak man, the strong man, the rich man, the poor man, and we play it all by imagination. For it was in the beginning conceived by imagination and then imagination is playing it all. For you are all imagination and God is all imagination. That's all that it is. The whole vast universe is nothing more than imagination ceaselessly creating that's what it is. So you and I are moving from state to state to state, either deliberately knowing what we are doing or f falling into it by headlines, by books we read, by all the things that confront us. And so tonight they simply hear anything on TV or radio and accept it. They know none of the facts and fall right into it. It makes you buy things you do not need. It makes you fill your house with all kinds of trivia that you have not the room for it. All because imagination is operating. Someone conceives a plot, a plan to get you to empty your pockets and you buy their trivia. You'll do it. Someone will. Because we are sound asleep in our journey until we turn around and start home. And then we begin to become more and more awake, more and more awake. Nothing about Jesus is known by those who think they are so very wise in this world. Only the seers, the mystics know who he is, for they have seen the flickering light that he claimed that he is. They've seen the light that he claimed that he is. They knew without seeing the face, the form, who it was. No loss of identity, but the same being, the same light. There aren't numbers of lights, just one vast, infinite light. So if one takes on all white and one all color and one something also, it's still the same wonderful, infinite light. And there's only Jesus Christ. There's nothing but Jesus Christ. There is my only God playing all the parts in the world so in the end you will know that he is love he is light he is spirit you'll know it from your own personal experience so if I stand here tonight standing here seeing all the facts of life here they are and then I shut it out mentally who in the world looking at me physically would know where I am dwelling in imagination so if I dwell in imagination where I would like to be dwelling elsewhere other than here. And then I see what I would see were I there. And then I open my eyes and I'm still here. You'd wonder, what did he do? Well, I moved within my own being, didn't I? Everything here that comes into my being comes into my, because of movement within God. In the beginning, God moved. Then the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. Genesis 1, 2, and wherever I go and stand, there it has been given to me. It was given to me in the beginning when the whole thing was conceived by us. And so one day, having done it, having gone through it and beginning to awaken, then the first one that came out stands there as the anchor and everyone comes through the same, reforming the same being. So when you and I awaken, we are drawn by our fiery brooding upon this wonderful mystery to the risen Christ, who is formed out of all. As we come into the risen Christ, we fuse, and the mortal reassumes immortality. 
So we fell into the mortal state where we have the experience of death. We go through it and then suddenly we return all gathered into the one being. So in the beginning, one came up first. Certainly one comes up first, but a second, a third, and the billions join into that one body and all form the one body without loss of identity, just as she could, without seeing a face, without seeing a form other than the light, know who it was. And she could from the highest mountain, she said, in the universe, I knew this was Paul. I knew this is Neville, but she didn't see a face. She didn't see a form, but she knew intuitively who it was that burst through the clouds and illuminated all that was there. So I tell you, you are the very being spoken of in scripture as the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the being spoken of as the Lord Jehovah who conceived the play. You and I did nothing that was wrong to warrant this. We deliberately did it. It was an adventure. And without an adventure, what is life? I mean, just to have someone leave me a million dollars so I can sit down and just have my help and be cushioned for a little tiny years that I flicker here. Is that living? But no, life must be an adventure. I must leave all behind he empties himself of all that he is and takes upon himself the form of a slave. The body is the form of a slave. This is the mask. And then he wears it. And no one knows who the wearer of the mask is. But you can meet anyone in this world that you have not known in eternity. But you don't know him when you see the mask. I looked at Benny. When Benny came home a week ago, I looked at him on that chair of mine and nothing but love came out of him, but nothing. I couldn't see his face. As you know, his skin is as dark as you can find. And I'm looking at the face and nothing but love is coming out of it. A being that I've known in eternity, knew him in the beginning, for we were all in the beginning. The Elohim. The Elohim. It's a plural. It's a compound unity, one made up of others. And here, he is as dark as I've ever seen a man. I'm not as light as you can see a man. But here we are, and you could think that we came out of different beings, but we didn't. We are only putting on masks. We're wearing masks. But he has turned around and so near the end, wearing a dark, dark mask when the whole thing is taken off. And who are we? the light of the world, infinite love, and yet put into one form, it is man. When you see man, that is actually the gathered togetherness of all, it is infinite love. I will know you by the light. You will know me by the light. But when we know each other, gathered as one, it's love and it's man. The human form divine and everyone is gathered into it and not one is lost for we agreed in the beginning we agreed to enter this in concert and we did then we went our seeming separate ways each falling into different states and blaming the other and discords came into our world that's all right, we'll resolve it. All will return and all the discords will be resolved into dissonance. And finally, into the most glorious harmony in the world. And then, we have expanded beyond whatever we were prior to this play. The whole thing is a play and the Elohim plays it. The Elohim is God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That word is Elohim, a plural word, a compound unity, one made up of others. So all are playing this glorious play. Now you can put me to the test and tonight just learn how to move. Just learn how to move. I teach it every night when I move beyond the world of dream. I do every night, but here we can take this small crowd. And so I stand here 
I put myself into an intimate brother, one who in the world is called brother, for he's my brother Victor. When he had nothing, but nothing the family had nothing, I mean broke, living on a little borrowed money, trying to open and run a small little shop on a side street. On the well, a side street in the Barbados is really a side street. They only had one main street, and so here on the little side street on borrowed capital, and he stands before one of the biggest buildings on the main street, and he looks and he sees what, if were true, would imply that our family owned it. In his imagination, he sees not F.N. Roach and Company, which was there. He sees a J.N. Goddard and Sons. Every day, on the way to the little shop on the side street, he sees it and he feels a thrill until finally it was fixed in his mind's eye. In that interval of two years of doing it, it failed. You see, that's wrong. Nothing is wrong in God's kingdom. We ate of the tree of good and evil and failed right and wrong. So he sees it in his mind's eye. The day of the sale of that building, a man who never came home for a cup of tea came in and asked him if he would buy the building, knowing he had no money. When my brother said to him, with what would I buy it? He said, well, I have the money. It's only, well, I have nothing in the bank, so if you would like to buy it, I'll buy it for you. I have my lawyer because they know I have money, and so if I start bidding, they'll bid me up. But if I get my lawyer, he represents other business people, and they won't know who he's bidding for. And so he got his lawyer to bid, only asked my brother to sign a little note. If I buy it, you will accept. And then pay me 6% of the money over a period of 10 years, reducing the principal every year. So at the end of 10 years, the principal will be paid back and you will have paid 6% on principal that is still due over the period of 10 years. My brother agreed to it that day. We owned the building. And then the sign went up, J.N. Goddard and Sons. Well, now what did it? Was it not all imagination? He didn't have a nickel. He couldn't put up as collateral a pair of rabbits. He had nothing. Whatever he had in the little store on the side, he owned someone money because they put it in the little bunch of groceries that we had. Yet he got this building. And then, with more borrowed capital, put it in and started. That's now back in 1922. Here it's 67. And from that little beginning, I don't know what the family owns. I only know that I own almost 10% of it. But I do not know what it's worth. But I don't think you could buy them out for $25 million. I don't think you could. And I hold 10% of the stock. But I haven't the slightest idea what it's worth. And I don't care. All I want to know is to tell my wife and my daughter and you. And all that I'm drawing into my world how it operates. So take it all tonight. And someone will rebuild it again. If you take everything and you know this principle... Can't you rebuild it? If it happens this way in the beginning, well, does it always happen this way? Certainly this is how it works. I imagine myself into what I am. If I like it, well, enjoy it. The day I tire of it, well then, I imagine myself into what I want to be. That's the story. So you become what you imagined yourself to be, good, bad, or indifferent. There is no deity outside of yourself who actually swore you into this place and condemned you into what you are doing. You did it, either wittingly or unwittingly, for God and your own wonderful human imagination are one. So when it is said in Scripture, I and my Father are one, He's only speaking of your own wonderful human imagination. So here, I have been sent to clarify and take off the barnacles on the story called the story of Jesus Christ. All right, a small beginning. What does it matter? You will outlive me and you will tell the story and tell it and bring it back to something near its original form for it's now as it's interpreted by the world, anything near. In fact, in this morning's paper, I read Buckley. I read him just because of his use of words. He's quite an interesting fellow. And he was speaking of the bishop of some part of England who spoke at the Cathedral of Canterbury. He said, I don't believe the good bishop would recognize a Christian if he met him. But to be honest, and to be kind to him, I don't think he would recognize Christianity if he read it. And may I tell you what he said prior to that, I would agree with Buckley. I don't 
always agree with anyone sometimes and sometimes not with everyone that I know. We agree sometimes and we disagree others. But today I certainly would agree that he quoted the bishop having said, I don't think he would recognize a Christian if he saw one. Well, that is only true of that bishop, but it's, that's true of all the priests that I've met, whether they call themselves cardinals or popes, so far removed from this wonderful, glorious story of Jesus, how God became you, all right, became us. He saw the mask, and the mask was the kind of mask that you see in Hawaii, you see in Africa. Haven't you seen that mask? You can't tell who wears it. Well, we have our little masks too, but we have little false things, and they all want to be identified. They don't need the kind of mask. When we go to the palatial party in the Western world, and we have a little false thing over your eyes, hoping that the one we really want to dance with really recognize us, we're not disguised at all. But they don't know that they are disguised in the very thing that they wear because no one knows who they are. They are part of the Elohim, who in the beginning conceived the play, who is playing it, and in the end all the masks are taken off, and it's taken off only in the resurrection. So I will say to my friend who wrote about this mask, that he saw and the empty skull was made of plastic. The day will come that with one of us whose mask is already taken off, we will ascend together and you will point out that skull and say of it, I once dwelt there. You will in this skull that was once your dwelling place and you take off the mask that you were never the thing that you wore, never, but in eternity we'll all know each other and all will be enhanced, expanded beyond what we were by the reason of the journey that we made. Now tonight you try this and you test it how to move. This is simple. I told you the story of my brother. Now take a simple little thing. Ask yourself simply, what do I want? Now look at the world as you now see it. If you had what you want, would you see it as you now see it? I doubt it. There would be a difference, some little change, the slightest change. I don't care what it is. But there would be a change. It need not be a change from where you now live. But there would be a change. You would see the world differently and naturally. Your closest circle would see you differently. Well, begin to let them see you differently and you see your world differently, all in imagination. This is a movement in God, for we are this operant power moving in our own being, for we are God. And so we move. As I move from where I am to where I would like to be, I can detect the motion only by a change of position relative to another object. For motion cannot be detected, save by a change of position relative to another object. To speak of the motion of a thing in itself without some frame of reference against which it moves is nonsense. You can't do it. And so, I stand here. Well, take it now physically. If I were elsewhere thinking of this club, I wouldn't see myself on the platform. I would see it as I now see it, but from another point. That vision would prove that I am not here. Now take it in another light. If I were now a man, take a person who would like, say, 30,000 a year income, and his income now is less than 10. All right. What would it be like if I had 30,000 a year? My present circle of friends, how would they see me? Would they know it? Would they discuss it? Would they speak of me as the one that they knew when he only made and they name it, say eight, nine, or ten thousand? Would they now speak of the change in his life? Well, now eavesdrop and listen to in on that so you hear your friends discuss you as one whose income is thirty thousand a year. Well, now that's a motion in being. That movement produces the results for everything in this world is nothing more than the result of a movement in God. And a movement in God is a motion in your own wonderful human imagination. And the slightest imaginal act, that is a change. I don't just mean just the act. I can't imagine something that I don't believe. If I imagine something that is something believed, that is a change that sends a thrill through a divine being. For that's creation. I'm creating something. 
I'm actually entering another state and making that state alive and real in my world. So tonight you try it. It costs you nothing, doesn't cost you a nickel to try it. But I'll tell you the risks that teachers run when they are sent. For when you stand in the presence of the one being who is drawing all towards itself, you run this risk. You are sent into the world to tell them of the most fantastic story in the world. And if they do not listen well, or do not apply what you tell them and become disillusioned, they hate the one who invited them to dream. So I'm only sent to invite you to dream, for the world is a dream. I'm inviting you to dream. But to dream consciously, deliberately, and if your hope is delayed and you think it isn't true, this whole thing is crazy insane. You invariably will turn all the fires of your being against the one who invited you to dream. And so, they said he was always rejected. Whenever he comes, he's rejected. Well, that is what he does. What does he do? He invites man to dream. For he tells man, whatever you desire, believe that you have received it and you will. Mark eleven twenty four. Well, now a man who makes that bold assertion and gets the compliments of those whose ear he reaches and they try it, but they do not know quite how to do it and they, afterwards, a while, they're disillusioned, they're disappointed, and then they've become so embittered they invariably hate the one who invited them to dream. So that's the risk every teacher who was sent must run. So I tell you, it's true anyway. And if one fails in the dream so that they cannot bring it into being, I will say to myself, well, then, how often must I tell them? Seventy times seven? Until they understand it. Not multiplying seventy by seven, but until they understand it. So I must repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And those who hear me will carry it forward and they will tell it. And in the end, they're all gathered back into the one being who conceived it. But we were that being and who plunged into the wonderful play. So when it was said to us in the beginning, it is time for the play to start. Not one of us failed to respond. In the first person present, I am ready. Now let us go into the silence. At the end of this lecture, Neville reads a letter. Traditionally, in these lectures, when he would say, let's go into the silence, he would give two minutes of silence. So we will wait for two minutes and then go over this letter.
This letter is about 20 pages long, and I will condense it for you. But really, it's one of the most marvelous things imaginable. Do you know what the story of Exodus is? And so I'll use that letter on Monday, this fantastic experience of this lady. So on Monday, it will be trust in God. Fantastic. The most incredible thing ever told man is true. And listen, says I will br- try to bring it down because there, these are 20 pages. She doesn't write me in big script, small hand. And I think when I say 20 pages, I'm being very conservative. But until the experience, I could not have conceived infinite love until love embraced me, infinite love. The first forms the anchor and all, and it increases. You can't believe it could increase, but it must as each comes into it. And here the immortal has finished the job. He was an immortal in the beginning, but he took on mortality. And then in the end, the mortal reassumes immortality when this one being embraces him. You didn't begin here as a little germ. Oh, let people say what they will about how you came out of a rock, turned a rock over, and some little thing came out of it. And then all of a sudden you began to move and you moved something else, the tadpole. The tadpole begins this. Oh, let them have all the fun they want with that. You didn't begin that way at all. You began in the beginning as God. You are the Elohim. And you played all these parts allowing all these beliefs, let them all get all their little medals. They get a present from this government, 50,000 for discovering that he came out of a tadpole. 57 then, $50,000 then. What he really wanted was the $50,000. And so man in his wonderful peculiar state believes that was true. We haven't the slightest, not an iota of evidence to support the belief in evolution. I saw a picture tonight on TV, this wonderful man and his child Yes, he has long hair. So let him have his long hair. What does it matter? The boy has long hair, but the father also has it. He has a beard, a very cultured gentleman, nice looking man, and his wife. And he said, I am here. I don't know, but I mean to hear him speak. He undoubtedly is a very cultured gentleman. And he said, why must we here be always for or against, pro or con? Can't we allow a certain freedom in this world? We either are against this or for this. And there is no other shading, black or white. Can't we have some shading in this world? So they sent this boy up 14 years old for some ponytail until he cuts his hair. He can't go back to school. Well, all this nonsense in the world, I mean, he hasn't disturbed the class. He hasn't come in and done things to the people. And so tomorrow, maybe he'll be wearing the long hair and we'll wonder what happened to that judge that disallowed it. Just like I presume today, if you saw Mr. Hoover, a perfectly wonderful gentleman with his tall collar up to here, choking him to death. You would send him to jail too. Get that collar off. You can't come into the meeting with a collar like that. Well, I mean, all this nonsense. In England, they still wear these long, silly things on their heads in court. The judge comes in with this long white something on his head. You know what it is, but this is the part of his world will allow others to be what they want to be. I mean, if you don't interfere with my freedom, then be what you want to be. You can come in here in the nude if you don't interfere with someone else, but with their prejudice, so what? If you're going to interrupt people's freedom, that's a different thing altogether. And here, the tape runs out for this lecture. And I just love this lecture, the idea of the mask, that we're all wearing a mask the explanation of the Elohim and the idea of moving in and out of states. The way he describes things, it's fascinating. And the explanation of the Bible is such a wonderfully unique explanation that it's still fun to ponder. But in any case, I'd love to get your comments and find out what you thought about this particular lecture. Are you wearing a mask? What mask are you wearing? We are all wearing a mask. Who is the wearer of the mask? Thank you so much for sharing this journey with me. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. 
Well, well, welcome to the Reality Revolution. Unlimited possibilities. Dedicated to the spirits who believe life is meant to be magical. Get out, yes, some really good meditations, and you discuss. It contains advanced viewpoints of the multidimensional human beings of the 21st century. I'm your host, Brian Scott. <laughs> Sometimes you need to go back. We were able to visualize when exploring stuff that's fun to explore. I can tell. Unleash your potential. Some topics on how to change the subconscious mind and some interesting... I'm your host, Brian Scott.